7,000 handshakes. Buckingham Palace officials wanted it referred to as a royal tour rather than a royal visit. They wanted Canadians to know the Queen was not merely a visitor, she was the Queen of Canada and she was at home here. It was a very successful tour and had many interesting features because of course uh, 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 the Queen arrived and uh, just after she arrived she, uh, it was confirmed that she was pregnant, that she was uh, expecting a child who of course became Prince Andrew, the present Duke of York. But she, and she told uh, the Canadian Prime Minister John Diefenbaker first. He was the first of her ministers anywhere to, to know this. Well, the Queen put in, despite of the fact that she was expecting a child, she put in this very heavy uh, uh, schedule uh, with, uh, without fail. And, and, uh, but, but towards the end, uh, she had to take a rest for a day. She got uh, a sort of sickness. And, of course, people thought, well, this was because of the, uh, the strenuous nature of the tour. And they actually criticized um, uh, government officials, the organizers of the tour, for this. But, of course, they didn't realize until afterwards that she was, it was because she was pregnant. But it was really one day only out of the entire tour. Others criticized the government for the cost of the tour. In 1939, when the Queen's father, King George VI, visited, there was little criticism, hardly any negative publicity. Twenty years later, though, times were changing. The Calgary Albertan called the tour hopelessly outdated and said it ceased to have any meaning to the Canadian people. But opinions were divided. The Vancouver Sun conducted a poll showing that 70% of the people were interested in the tour. The crowds which greeted the royal couple grew larger and larger and more enthusiastic. In Toronto, 200,000 people showed up. In Regina, an estimated 100,000, equal to the city's population. Despite this, it was decided that the 1959 tour would be the last of its kind. Members of the royal family would come for a specific occasion not for a tour. In 1963, Lester B. Pearson became Prime Minister. He later wrote in his memoirs, I had been anxious to abandon the Royal Trans-Canada tour idea, and so had the palace. Since then, the Queen and Duke of Edinburgh have visited Canada 20 times and been witness to many historic occasions. In 1967, the Queen celebrated Canada's centenary by visiting Ottawa and Expo 67 the World's Fair held in Montreal. Less than a decade later, she returned to Montreal in 1976 to open the Olympic Summer Games. There was some opposition to her coming. One organization from Quebec sent a telegram to the Queen warning of trouble if she opened the Games. The Queen's visit to Quebec City in 1964 was marred by controversy. There were confrontations between protesters and police when anti-royal and separatist demonstrators chanted, Elizabeth, stay at home. It was the nastiest greeting royalty had ever received in Canada, wrote one Toronto Star reporter. Scenes like this were not repeated in 1976, and the Queen arrived without incident. It was the only time the entire royal family had been abroad in one place. The Queen's daughter, Princess Anne, was competing on the British equestrian team. The Queen's children, her three sons and husband, joined her to cheer on the princess. One reporter said, seeing the Queen and her children so at ease with each other during this trip gave Canadians a whole new impression of the royals. Despite the heavy security, the Queen seemed to welcome the media. One television journalist commented, it was the first time Canadians had seen the royal family at work and at play, seen them as people, not merely as symbols surrounded by ceremony. I think what the difference was, the, well, two things. First of all, the Queen was doing different things at, at the Olympics. It wasn't uh, her usual sort of round of tours where you, know, you, where you have official receptions and this kind of thing. So there was that difference. Also, um, the Canadians at that point actually had, of course, a member of the royal family living in Canada, and that because it was the days when Prince Andrew had, was at school at Lakefield. So I think that made the royal family very, very much more topical. It also um, shows 
oppose the um, the changes that the monarchy was going through. I originally, the monarchy, uh, the sovereign in, in being the monarch of the country, dealt with uh, with a little group of people, you know, the ministers, the courtiers. Now, of, with with the, of course, the uh, inclusion of the of everybody in in the in the political structure of the country, then of course that changed. And the and and uh, since that happened over um, a fairly long period, it took a while for the for the, uh, the royal family to adjust to that. And uh, and I think uh, it, it goes ahead in stages. And I think that in 1976 was probably one stage, at least with regard to Canada, where that uh, where that happened um, because. Uh, things were not done for just a little group of people anymore. They were done for the general public, so the public expected to see these things, and, and the royal family responded in kind. The Queen really cuts across demographics in terms of her appeal, old and young, rich and poor. Like, uh, it doesn't matter what your background, whether you're from a British background, whether you're uh, a recent uh, arrival, uh, all seem to have this this passion for for the queen and this this connection this sense that she's really like all of our grandmothers and uh, so I think that's that's part of the appeal and why she was so well received is because she's been there from the beginning she's been there for all the milestones one of those milestones was the patriation of the Constitution and the creation of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms on April 17 1982 in a ceremony attended by over 30,000 and watched by millions of Canadians across the country Canada's new constitution was proclaimed by the Queen. A year later in 1983, the Queen's eldest son and heir to the throne, Prince Charles, visited Canada with his wife, Diana, Princess of Wales. During their 18-day stay, they visited Newfoundland to mark the 400th anniversary of the island becoming a British colony. This visit to Newfoundland was the most lengthy one on the Canadian tour. Journalist Barbara Yaffe covered the event as a young reporter. The turnout of crowds was enormous. You know, it, I, it was really, the weather was so bad, and yet people just uh, flocked to where Charles and Diane, wherever they went, the people just flocked to where they went. And uh, they were so enthusiastic about seeing them and very supportive of the visit. I didn't hear one negative word back then, and I think uh, people may have been enthusiastic about some of their politicians. I remember covering Brian Peckford, who was the Premier then, and he knew how to rouse a, a, an audience, but um, I think this was a different, a different type of um, support for Charles and Diana. It was, in some measure, celebrity watching, um, and this was a new married couple who seemed to be in love, and there was a lot of goodwill for them. So it was different than the um, the positive response to po that you generally see to some politicians. It was uh, it was more enthusiastic. We have this famous recollection of of Diana's uh, saying that there were three in the marriage, and that was almost from the beginning. But you know, from the way he he behaved towards her, I, I think at the beginning of the marriage they they had some kind of positive arrangement between them. At least it was in evidence during the Newfoundland trip. Twenty-six years later, Prince Charles returned to Newfoundland, this time with his second wife, the Duchess of Cornwall. A crowd of 57 people turned out to welcome them to the small seaside town of Cupids. In 1983, when Prince Charles had toured with Princess Diana, there was standing room only. Doug Saunders in the Globe and Mail wrote, If you wanted to choose a time and place when the wedding of Prince William to Kate Middleton transformed itself from mere nuptials into the signature tactic in a full-scale crisis of succession, it was November 2nd, 2009, in the seaside town of Cupids, Newfoundland. I agree with Doug Saunders. I think the Cupids visit was a marker that showed that uh, people have sort of lost patience uh, with Charles. He was a known philanderer. You know, I think the, the visit spoke for itself. I think that there's been a, for quite a few years now, people have worried about the succession issue because of Charles, and it's something I've written about, because I generally believe um, people are disappointed in the current Prince of Wales, and uh, he's not a good advertisement for the monarchy. Uh, there are reasons independent of Charles to 
uh, for Canadians to move on from having our head of state be uh, the monarch in Britain. But uh, he certainly doesn't help the issue. Others disagree with Saunders' statement. Well, I think it's a bit unfair because when the Possibly prince and princess of Wales came in, in 1983, in, yes, they, um, they were a young couple who'd just been married and, and had their first child uh, in a, and married in a ceremony which the whole world uh, saw, in effect. Um, when the prince came in, um, in 2009, of course, he was a middle-aged man uh, with, uh, with a second wife who was also middle-aged. So I think, uh, I think that's, uh, that's a bit, uh, a bit um, uh, hard on, on him. And the rest of that tour in 2009, of course, was a success, and there were large crowds. Um, I, a part of the problem with, with, with actual crowds now, of course, are, are the security measures because the security people don't want uh, actual places where the royal family are going to be uh, to be announced until the last minute. Well, of course, that prevents people from making plans. Though people did make plans for the Queen's visit in 2010, it marked her 22nd official tour to Canada and for nine days she toured Canada with Prince Philip. The British newspaper The Telegraph wrote, the Queen's visit to Canada was a roaring success, drawing record-breaking crowds eager to see the monarch in the flesh in what may well prove her valedictory tour. Closer to home, the Globe and Mail published an editorial stating, it succeeded in showing that Canada's constitutional monarchy is not something of the past, but like the Queen herself, of the present and future too. She was here to celebrate big uh, milestones in, in Canadian life, you know, celebrating the centenary of the Navy coming to Canada Day. I mean, these, these are things that linger in people's memories for generations. Um, the, the fleet review that they had in Halifax for the, the, the centennial, I mean, that's unlike anything that that harbour had seen for uh, decades and decades, if at all. Uh, so this is, th these are um, tr tremendous events and it's only the Queen that can really pull the people out. You know, no politician has that kind of drawing power. I think that was a, a really um, significant event because for a long time uh, the Canadian government hasn't asked the Queen to carry out a lot of the functions which which she has carried out before at times or uh, which uh, we'd expect the sovereign to carry out. So in a way it was a return of the Queen to center stage in Canada. There certainly was a wonderful feeling because I saw the Queen at, at Queen's Park here in Toronto and I, I couldn't believe it. The majority of the crowd were young people and they were were shouting out, we love you, we love you. And you know, for a Toronto crowd, that is <laughs> extraordinary indeed. My own view is that the royal family has become uh, a focus of celebrity worship. And it's almost like it's our version of Hollywood. And these are tremendously wealthy people who live in exotic lifestyle and wear fabulous clothes and conduct themselves with most of them anyway conduct themselves with the measure of dignity and I think people are really fascinated and interested in them for that reason I don't think all the crowds turn out because the Queen is necessarily uh, necessarily turn out because the Queen is our head of state one young royal couple that have become celebrities and media sensations are Prince William and Kate Middleton now officially known as the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge. A few months before they married, in a ceremony watched by millions, they announced that their first official trip as a married couple would be to Canada. I think they've chosen Canada because Canada invited them. And also, Canada, uh, since it's had this long relationship with, with the royal family, uh, um, c considers that it has a right to be sort of the, the, fir the first after, after the UK. Um, and this, is, this has been a Canadian attitude, which I, I, I think I said goes back to the fact that the members of the royal family have actually lived here at times. I think that's, that's really the key to it. There's no doubt the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge will attract large, enthusiastic crowds and media attention from around the globe. Officials are stating this royal visit will be on a size and scale like nothing Canada has seen before. This is the recreative nature of the monarchy. 
that each generation of society can identify with it. Young people identify and get very excited about uh, about uh, a young couple, young heirs to the throne, like the uh, the Duke and Duchess. I've been describing this effect lately as uh, Monarchy 2.0. This is the institution reinventing itself for a new generation, and that's the strength of monarchy: is that it it does change with the times. With each new generation, it adapts to the new circumstances and reshapes itself to make it relevant, because that's the only way that constitutes constitutional monarchy really can survive. I have no doubt that the monarchy of 50 years from now will be different in some significant ways from the monarchy of today, just as the monarchy of today is different from what it was in 1919. Uh, and, uh, but it will adapt and uh, it will change. That's been the story of Canada and the Canadian Crown, its adaptability and its progressiveness.